Hello, my name is Dr. Cedar Reiner. I am Associate Professor and Chair here in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience here at Randolph-Macon. Uh, this is my brief introduction video uh, to myself and my own academic journey uh, that led me here to Randolph-Macon. Who is Dr. Reiner? Well, uh, as I already told you, I'm a professor here at Randolph-Macon and um, I love to play with illusions. This is one of my favorite illusions. Uh, those blue circles are in fact circles, they're not spirals, even though the way that the illusion is created, it makes your eyes move around that, that image so that it looks like spirals. They are circles. There, I proved it for you. Those are circles. First, I'd like to play with Photoshop. Uh, this is uh, another fun illusion. Um, this is a picture made up of lots of little pictures, and it actually works better if you squint at this picture. Uh, it comes out to be a picture of me, kind of like a mug shot of me. Um, uh, it also works if you get far away, or if you're on your phone screen, it probably is working even better. Um, so some personal history, uh, early portrait of a nerd. Um, that is me at my sixth grade science fair project. Uh, I, um, I was very interested in illusions from a young age. I just thought perception was a very cool topic. Uh, so I was very interested. I, um, I cut up uh, illusions from a book and uh, made copies and showed it to other people and asked what they saw. Uh, you, if you asked me then uh, in sixth grade if it was possible to do that for a living, I would say absolutely not. I think I probably wanted to be a doctor. Uh, maybe a scientist at that time. Um, and uh, as it turns out, here I am 30 years later, and I study optical illusions, I study uh, visual perception as uh, a vision scientist and a professor here at Randolph-Macon. Um, that is also a picture of my brain. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I had a chance to participate in one of the cognitive neuroscience studies that my lab was running. Um, and that brain seems to be working just fine. It looks a little lumpy to me at places, but uh, it's working okay. Fingers crossed. I also played uh, a lot of chess uh, in junior high and high school, um, and I played baseball and soccer uh, in junior high and high school. Uh, that um, bottom left picture uh, is the yearbook picture of my middle school uh, chess team, and a friend of mine uh, said that that sweater I'm wearing there at the bottom left is an optical illusion, so maybe my interest in illusions was continuing. Um, there I am playing baseball, uh, pitching uh, at Woodrow Wilson, where I went to high school in Washington, D.C., uh, and I also coach soccer camp um, at AU. I believe that, um, that picture is taken when we were at uh, Trinity College in D.C. Um, uh, for that summer. When I went to college, I was a history of science major. Um, I think this gives me a kind of historical uh, view on a lot of the topics that I teach, which I, I find valuable. Um, there in that bottom left uh, corner of that is me on the first, my first day of college with my dad. Uh, I actually had a kind of rough transition to college. Um, classes were more difficult than I expected, um, and I just had a rough transition living away from home. Uh, and the class that most appealed to me, that was most interesting to me that first year, was a class on science and society in the 20th century. Um, and that was, that was a really interesting topic to me. I was also very interested in psychology, so I ended up doing uh, a lot of coursework in psychology, but also in the history of science. Um, what you're seeing there, that pic uh, the two historical pictures, are examples of... Um, mesmerism uh, and animal magnetism. So the mesmerism baquette uh, etching there by Delaude Desiree um, is people got together and it was kind of a party and you can see those those rods coming out of what seems to be a table. That was actually a tank of water uh, and the idea was that Antoine Mesmer um, was the pioneer of this was that you'd hold on to that rod and you'd kind of exchange animal magnetism with the other people who were there 
uh, and kind of go into sort of a trance state, become aware of your unconscious and go into a more or less trance state. This was a precursor to some studies of hypnotism uh, and we still use um, the word mesmerized that comes from Antoine Mesmer. Uh, as you can see the bottom picture of the the man and the woman there, they're sort of the man is exchanging animal magnetism uh, with the woman. Uh, and this seems like a, an odd chapter in the history of science, um, but when you study the history of psychology you can see one of this, the things that this led to was more interest in the unconscious and interest in um, unconscious forces. Now they, uh, Mesmer kind of took it pretty literally that they're like electrical forces, um, which was quite odd uh, and did not survive the test of time. But um, I think it's pretty interesting to think about uh, historical precedent um, and historical uh, trajectories of the concepts we have in psychology today. Um, there, me with my mask, you can see uh, that is actually a very famous map in the history of science. It's um, a map, uh, it's called the John Snow's Cholera Map. It's a map of how the, um, doctor in London, John Snow, figured out where cholera was spreading uh, by graphing where the cases were on a map. And it turned out it was spreading through the water uh, and he found out that the Broad Street pump where many people were getting their water was spreading cholera. After college, I uh, worked for a psychiatrist. I was a psychiatrist assistant, and uh, I worked at George Washington University Hospital. Um, in fact, I was born at George Washington University Hospital as well, so I worked uh, kind of a, right across the street from where I was born, which is kind of interesting, um, in D.C. Uh, I was interested in entering psychology and clinical psychology, was not sure what I wanted to do. I thought maybe I would go back to medical school to become a psychiatrist after I got my pre-med requirements. Um, after uh, working for a psychiatrist, this is Dr. Frederick Goodwin. He was an expert on uh, manic depressive illness and bipolar disorder. Uh, I worked at in his office, um, answer the phones, things like that, and I got an experience of what it was like to to be a psychiatrist and be involved in mental health. Um, and I sort of saw that, that wasn't a great match for me, um, and uh, it was also not a great job for me, uh, that particular job. Uh, so after six months, I left that job, and um, and worked in another job in D.C. where I worked for. Uh, the American Psychological Association. I was actually a registered lobbyist for the American Psychological Association in the Science Policy Office. So the largest organization of psychologists has uh, clinical psychologists who treat uh, mental health and mental illness. Um, the American Psychological Association also represents um, psychological scientists, cognitive psychologists, perceptual psychologists, social psychologists, um, and uh, what I did, I advocated for the science of psychology uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, arguing to Congress that uh, investing in the science of psychology was a worthwhile pursuit. Um, one of the things I learned is uh, how our nation spends its money. Uh, here's an example of 2019, uh, the federal budget. Um, mandatory spending, that dark blue line there, makes up most of the spending. Uh, that's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and um, some other mandatory spending that's not subject to uh, congressional approval. And then some is subject to congressional approval, and that's discretionary spending, of which you can see about half and half is defense versus non-defense. Um, so when I worked for the American Psychological Association, um, one of the things I would do is advocate for science spending in general. And you can see here on this next slide, uh, this is the 2019, how much uh, spending has happened in um, of that discretionary spending, and about half is defense. Uh, and as we can see, uh, everything else that the federal government spends money on is about the other half. I focused on um, the general science, space, and technology. Believe it or not, there are psychologists who work for NASA, who work um, in the National Science Foundation uh, and do all sorts of scientific research. Uh, that is a, that very small slice up at the 
uh, you know, up at the upper left there. Um, there's also veterans benefits and services. A lot of uh, psychological research and a lot of practicing psychologists work for the VA and the American Psychological Association advocates for them and for adequate spending for those needs. I have an arrow also pointed to the defense budget. Um, you might not think that psychologists would necessarily work as uh, soldiers and war fighters, but uh, many psychologists do work for the Department of Defense, and the Department of Defense also does scientific research, uh, psychological research, um, and so the American Psychological Association would advocate for uh, psychologists at the Department of Defense and for the Department of Defense to fund psychological research. After uh, two years working for the American Psychological Association, I uh, decided I wanted to get more psychological training myself, so I went to a doctoral program in cognitive psychology at the University of Virginia. Um, it looks like I'm very busy working on my computer there. In fact, I'm playing with Photoshop again, uh, even though I did often uh, work on my three monitors there, look at graphs, uh, talk with my fellow graduate students and my graduate advisor. Uh, at that moment, I was playing with Photoshop and pasting myself, multiple copies of myself in, uh, in the image. Um, as you can see in that other photo, I am uh, very happy to be graduating after seven years uh, in my uh, graduating with my PhD uh, after seven years at, uh, in Charlottesville at the University of Virginia. Along the way, and it may have contributed to me taking a little bit longer, uh, my wife and I started a family. Um, my two twins there, twin boys, uh, were three years old when I graduated, and my daughter was three months old. Um, and they, uh, my boys are now high school seniors, and uh, my daughter is in eighth grade. Academic interests. Uh, I have a few interests in psychology. Uh, the first interest is the basic perception of spatial layout. So what is, uh, how do we see how far away things are from us and uh, how slanted hills are? Uh, if you get a chance to watch uh, another presentation, um, I'm going to present to you my research on the slant of hills and how, those, uh, how our perception of the slant of hills is affected by the state of our body. Uh, but in general, the idea of my basic research and perception is that what we see is influenced by uh, our body, but what we plan, by what we plan on doing with our bodies, by what our bodies are capable of that affects our vision and affects our perception. Um, I'm also interested in illusions. This is another one of my favorite illusions. Uh, this is actually, those are spirals, uh, don't worry, that's correct. But in fact, in this image, um, there are three colors. There is one orange, one pink, and then there's a third color that's kind of a bluish green. But what you see as blue and what you see as green in that image is the same color. I'm also very interested in public science outreach, in sharing the science of psychology. I think that's something I've taken from my days at APA uh, and explaining to congressional staff uh, what psychology was. I think it's very important for psychologists and psychological scientists to get out in the community and um, bring science to the world. So I've given science talks in places like bars. Uh, that's a picture of me at the Camel Pub in Richmond back in the before times. I uh, haven't done that recently, as you might imagine, um, but I'm looking for ways of sharing psychological science to, uh, with the public. I'm also interested in applying what we know about cognitive science, about the science of memory and attention, uh, and motivation, applying what we know about cognitive science to education and educational settings, both in my own teaching and in uh, K through 12 classrooms. So I published some uh, some work on that, and I've also recently uh, collaborated with Daniel Willingham um, at the University of Virginia on the fourth edition of uh, of a cognitive psychology textbook um, called Cognition: The Thinking Animal. Um, so if you get a chance to take cognitive psychology with me, um, you might be able to see some pictures of Randolph-Macon in that textbook and some other pictures of my kids. Uh, so um, I'm very interested in applying cognitive science to being a better educator and helping people be better educators and better students. Personal interests. I've mentioned my family. That is a strong personal interest of mine. Uh, there they are all grown up um, on my front porch. Uh, on Father's Day, 
um, where they gave me that uh, fantastic shirt, which I can't always wear out in public. Uh, but um, there, there we are. Uh, I'm also interested in government and policy, uh, in local government, um, as well as national government and policy. Uh, being from D.C., having that experience working um, for the APA, uh, working with Congress, um, has given me a very uh, an enduring interest in government and policy. Uh, most recently, I've been on the Parks and Rec Committee um, for the town of Ashland, helping to design parks, um, helping to plan our local pool. Um, I think that's very important service work, uh, and I continue to be involved in it. Uh, now I'm on the local board of the, the Patrick Henry YMCA, um, and I think that's another part of um, serving our community. Um, so let me see. I think that's all the slides that I have. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you one more illusion, um, another of my favorite real-world illusions. This is a, one of my toys here. Uh, it's a 3D printed object, and this is one of those things that works pretty well on camera. As you can notice, this is a, it's a kind of plastic object of, um, of a set of squares. But um, as you can tell, I study perception. I'm always interested in the different things that happen when we perceive the world in a little bit different way or from a different perspective. So if I take my, uh, my 3D object here and rotate it, now all of a sudden it circles, squares and circles. Uh, and if you get a chance to take sensation and perception, I'll give you a more in-depth explanation of how that happens. Thanks for your attention, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at Randolph-Macon in one of my classes or uh, through any other work, uh, any other contact I have you, with you as department chair.